You are listening to the Marginalized Conflicts podcast series, a project of the Introduction to Peace and Conflict Studies course at Colgate University in fall 2008. As a collective, we selected present and past conflicts which we feel are marginalized, either in our own study of history and politics or in dominant narratives of both. We aim to inform, surprise, shock, and inspire. I'm Miriam Neustadt. And today's podcast is about the first modern-day genocide, the Armenian Genocide, and the enduring controversy on a seemingly definable event. The Armenian Genocide, or should I say the Armenian Conflict, is considered to be the first large-scale, systematic murder of civilians in our modern era. To be more blunt, this massacre built the foundation for the word genocide, and in a way, it defined it. Yet, if I were to be politically correct in terms of American-Turkish relations— I technically couldn't call the event a genocide. I could call it the Armenian Massacres or the Great Calamity, but not Armenian Genocide. What is it about the word genocide that scares people, more specifically the Turkish government, so much? Let's step back and talk first about what actually happened. Pre-World War I, the Ottoman Empire, also known as modern-day Turkey, also known as a Muslim country, despite pressures made by the Christian European powers, virulently persecutes its Christian Armenian population. World War I. The Ottoman Empire enters the war alongside Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Bulgaria in 1914, forming the Central Powers. They oppose Britain, France, and Russia, the Triple Entente. Talat Pasha, an important player in our story, the former Turkish interior minister, uses these circumstances to ensue a holy war on the Armenians with the intention of extermination. He begins his holocaust with the false premise that the government is merely quelling the many Armenian revolts. On April 25, 1915, the Allies invade Turkey. That same day, in Constantinople, 250 Armenian intellectuals are arrested and executed. After passing the Tehrir Law, a law that authorizes the deportation of any Armenian, the government strips the Armenians of all their rights as citizens and confiscates their property. This complete dehumanization permits Ottoman troops and civilians to murder, rape, and pillage without restraint. The Western world is quickly made aware of the atrocities occurring in the Ottoman Empire. The New York Times frequently reports on these horrifying conditions. October 4th, 1915. The report tells of children under 15 years of age thrown into Euphrates to be drowned, of women forced to desert infants in arms and to leave them by the roadside to die, of young women and girls appropriated by the Turks, thrown into harems, attacked, and or else sold to the highest bidder, and of men murdered and tortured. Everything that an Armenian possesses, even the clothes on his back, are stolen by his persecutors. Many are outraged by these injustices, but responses are slow-moving. Another important figure, Henry Morgenthau Sr., the foreign ambassador to the Ottoman Empire at the time, is tremendously outraged by the events taking place. Time and time again, he attempts to reason with Talat, but alas, he is unsuccessful. Talat once retorted to Morgenthau's confrontation, saying, Why are you so interested in the Armenians anyway? You are a Jew. These people are Christians. What have you to complain of? Why can't you let us do with these Christians as we please? He then attempts to reason with those more powerful in Washington, but he is still mostly unsuccessful. He often appeals to the Secretary of State, with dispatches giving very detailed accounts of the Armenian situation. The United States government, shaped by Wilsonian ideals, however, is too emotionally involved with its prudent policies of neutrality to step in. Morgenthau implores private institutions to intercede. Monetary and humanitarian efforts were made. For example, the American Committee on Armenian Atrocities was created by notable Americans, namely Rabbi Stephen S. Wise, Frederick Lynch, Norman Hapgood, Samuel T. Dutton, among others. On October 16, 1915, the committee writes an American appeal to America for help. The committee convened in order to investigate the evidence bearing on Armenian persecution, which was sent by missionaries, refugees, and nonpartisans to American friends in the State Department at Washington. The result is a report just released by the committee, a veritable blue book of atrocities. It is a record of a peaceful people driven under the whip like beasts from their home into exile among populations of different race, religion, and language, of men bound and shot, of tortured prisoners, 
of women outrage, children drowned, and old men beaten to death of starvation and suffering, loot and massacre. There were many entities like the ACAA. However, their combined efforts had very nominal effect on the Armenian situation and little influence on the decisions of the Turkish government. So how does the story end? United States of America enters the war on the side of the Entente powers. By 1918, the war is over and the Central Powers have been defeated. There is no way to definitely figure how many Armenians were slaughtered between 1915 and 1918, but figures range from 300,000, a figure maintained by the Turkish government, to one and a half million. The Entente Powers aspire to create the first international war crimes tribunal. Secretary of State Robert Lansing argued the veracity of a global moral court. He believed that the world could not and would not be governed by a narrowly defined morality. Furthermore, the United States would not participate in a court of this nature. The court never comes to fruition. What were the consequences of this atrocity? Well, first and foremost, it created a foundation for Hitler less than 30 years later. While trying to convince his associates that his Holocaust could be overwhelmingly successful, he states, Who, after all, speaks today of the annihilation of the Armenians? Today, the Turkish government does everything in its power to prevent the passing of an American resolution legitimizing the massacres as genocide. In fact, Article 301 in the Turkish Penal Code states that it is an insult, rather a crime, to consider the Armenian deaths genocide. People have been accused and brought to court for this crime. The Turks can join the Armenian deaths with all the other casualties during World War I and claim that the overall tragedy of the war consequently brought about the creation of modern-day Turkey in 1923. Time and time again, the U.S. House of Representatives will attempt to pass this legislation because of its symbolic weight despite the protests of the Turks. Considering the war on terror and the overall global climate, the United States holds dearly to its relationship with Turkey. And when the Turks threaten to sever ties and support for issues like the war in Iraq, the Bush administration jumps to its feet to prevent any further proceedings. As a result, the American government has technically done nothing. Many Americans feel passionate about passing a resolution because, after the many failed attempts, symbolically this acknowledgement finally honors the dead by demanding accountability and justice. Yet justice, this beloved American value, has become paradoxical. When heinous crimes against humanity have been committed, shouldn't those responsible be punished? Shouldn't justice prevail? To learn more about the Armenian Genocide and the American struggle between morality and politics, please visit the Armenian National Institute at www.armenian-genocide.org and www.genocide1915.info. This series is made possible by a collaboration among Clarence Maybe, Ray Nardelli, Rich Grant, Tyrell Habercorn, the student audio assistants, and the members of Introduction to Peace and Conflict Studies at Colgate University. The music is provided by Poddington Bear. Thank you very much. <laughs>